Hello everyone, welcome back to Elefino Open number 17. I am still joined by my good friend uh, Beardress. Lots of awesome commentary from you. Thank you for joining us so far. Yeah, thanks man. No problem. Appreciate it. Happy to be. Cool. So uh, we are getting ready to start the championship match of Elefino Open number 17 between Mickle Go and Aaron. You can see the bracket on your screen so you can see how these phenomenal players got here. Just a quick rundown of what this tournament is, in case you're just joining us. This is a 256-player open tournament. It takes place on the Americas region servers. So they play through a single elimination bracket. It's uh, All matches are best of five, uh, conquest format with a ban. So basically what that means is uh, each player has three classes, that, or four classes that they select. Their opponent bans one of them leaving each player with three classes, and they must win with all three of those classes in order to take the match. So in case you weren't familiar with Conquest Format, that's just a very brief rundown of what Conquest Format is. Uh, going into the championship match here, though, we will do some quick uh, sellout thank yous to our sponsors. Uh, you can see Strivewire on the bottom middle of your screen. Strivewire.com is a phenomenal website. They host a lot of open tournaments for both the Americas and the European region. So you'll definitely want to check out that website, Strivewire.com, if you're interested in getting involved in the open uh, Hearthstone scene at all and try to get some of those points. Maybe you can make it into those uh, Hearthstone Championship two or larger tournaments because the, uh, at the end of each season... As you're probably aware, the top 128 point earners get to play in a large tournament for the chance at a seat all the way at BlizzCon. So if you want to go there, a lot of the players start off in tournaments such as this one. So definitely check out strivewire.com and you'll get, uh, get your path started to greatness. But uh, that'll be enough sellout for us. We're getting ready to start here between the championship match between Mickelgo and and Aaron, Bear, just do you mind going over their lineups for me real quick? Yeah, sure, Elefino. Uh, looks like Mikkelgo will be playing uh, his Tempo Mage, his Zoo Warlock, and the Warrior deck that was banned out in the last match we didn't get to see. Uh, his Druid was banned. Uh, Aaron playing Paladin, uh, the Murloc Paladin that we saw, the Reno Warlock, and the Control Warrior as well. We're going to see all three of those decks again. His Druid was banned again. Uh, so it looks like we are going to see a couple interesting matchups here uh, between Aaron and Mikkelgo. We've got. Uh, I'm curious to see what this warrior is based on yeah, that we saw Mikkelgo ban the Druid again. I have to believe that this warrior is going to be more of a control warrior since Patron is more favored against the uh, Patron's more favored against the Druid as well as uh, Zoo has a more favorable matchup against Druid. So I believe that this warrior is going to be control. So we may see some control mirrors here uh, in one capacity or another, whether or not it's Reno against control warrior or control warrior against control warrior. Uh, Aaron's Murloc Paladin, though, is going to be very, very, very strong against that warrior deck if he can queue into it. He should have a fairly easy win in that matchup, one would imagine, as long as he can draw his cards in a timely manner. Okay, we are ready for game one of the championship match. Ella Final Open number 17. You're going to have Aaron on the bottom of your screen opening up with Warlock. Meanwhile, Mikkelgo on the top of your screen opening up with that mage. So it should be a very interesting matchup. What's your, what's your take up on this matchup? Um, I take up on this matchup. Um, it's definitely going to be a very back and forth matchup here between the uh, the Reno player and the Mage. It depends on how quickly Reno can assemble threats on the board to counter the Mage, or whether or not the Mage can just have that very bursty start. It also depends on if uh, we do see Aaron playing the Reno lock actually pick up Reno Jackson. Those healing definitely. spells are definitely very important in this matchup. Uh, the more resources you can force the Mage to burn out of, the more important. Uh, it's going to be. We are going to see Aaron's starting hand of my control tech, Lotheb Sylvanas. I don't think he's mulliganed quite he yet. He has not. I don't think either player has. They've, they've both been uh, playing chicken with the mulligans so far. Ooh, yeah, Mikkelgo picks up a huge mulligan. Yeah, we see Mikkelgo with a very, uh, excuse me, very strong opener here. We're going to see this uh, this mana worm, uh, the mana worm into the apprentice, into the flame waker possible coin spell. And Aaron over here, he does pick up the molt giant, which can be very useful in this matchup since his life total can get pressured very quickly. 
But uh, the Lothab on five, too, he does fortunately pick up an Earthen Ring and a Dark Peddler to give him at least uh, something to do on these earlier turns, which are going to be very important since Mikkelgo got that one, two, three start to open with. Yeah, absolutely. The, a timely Lothab could come in huge here if the game uh, if the game gets that far, but probably not as much as it would against a Freeze Mage, but definitely a timely Lothab can, can swing a match. Yeah, a Timely Lothab can absolutely go ahead and put a nail in the coffin of this matchup. It can just swing entire turns where Mikkelgo is sitting on nothing but spells, and uh, he just gets locked out of playing anything for an entire turn. Uh, as is, though, we have to see Aaron. He's considering playing this Dark Peddler, just tapping here. Uh, the Dark Peddler is not... And it's not a very attractive play here because it does just open you up to being traded uh, with some spells or getting this, uh, this Mana Worm to trade out pretty easily. Uh, so he's going to go ahead and opt for that life tap here, picking up into Jaraxxus. Uh, Jaraxxus is a so-so card in this matchup. He can be useful if your opponent has already burned out most of their spells and you need him as a heal, but he can also just be a detriment to you if you're going to take a lot of HP loss from there, unless you can guarantee you can close that game out. Yeah, I, I love your analysis on some of these matchups because I can definitely tell that you're... I knew this going in, but you can definitely tell that you're a very high uh, skill level player in some of the, the analysis that you have. I, I really enjoy listening to it. So thank you for like, that. <laughs> thanks, man. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, We're going to see him go ahead and drop that Sorcerer's Apprentice to lower the cost here. And this sets up for a really great... Um, wow. And he's Yeah, he's going to get straight played into it. Uh, we we possibly are oh. going to see this, uh, this Flame Waker coin Frostbolt. Or we're just going to see the Arcane Intellect go ahead and power up. And then he'll trade the uh, Frostbolt in. Opting to keep the Flame Waker back. Uh, this is safer against some of, uh, some of Aaron's board clears. And this is going to pressure the same amount of damage. This also makes sure that, one, you don't lose the coin, and two, you don't lose any of the wasted damage from the coin by seeing those shots hit before you Frostbolt. Sure. Yeah, I was going to point that out as well. It plays a little bit around Hellfire. Not that the Flamebreaker would have died to the Hellfire, but uh, you didn't want to entice him too much to, to get a lot of advantage out of that. Yeah. Instead of we Mortal Coil next turn, maybe. Yeah, we are going to see this uh, this Dark Peddler come down, and I think... I seem to be missing the Discover here. Can you see the three uh, cards he's getting to Discover right now? Uh, I do not, which is weird. Usually we can, so I apologize to our viewers at home. It seems to be a small spectator bug. He does t pick up a Voidwalker, though. Yeah, does pick up the Voidwalker out of here. A nice little taunt minion. Uh, hopefully keep some of that uh, some of that pressure off his face. But we do see... Uh, we've seen the Dr. Boom picked up by Mikkelgo, which is going to be important for his early game. And we are seeing just these draw spells keep these, uh, these big... Uh, mana worms alive on board and we are going to see it looks like he's hovering opting to trade the flame cannon for the 2-2 two, two, to keep this board pressure up uh, his, this makes him a little bit weaker to hellfire but we probably would have seen hellfire cashed in that turn right uh, yeah I tend to agree with you there he's also using his a lot of his low level spells when he's still got the flame waker in hand if he holds on to that too long and uses all these spells he's going to lose value off that minion yeah, very true. If all these spells are gone by the time it gets around, he will at least have the coin to follow it up, and possibly a coin fireball to generate some value. But uh, the later he holds the Flame Waker, the weaker it does get, certainly. But I, I definitely understand not wanting to... Uh, if you wanted to keep the Sorcerer's Apprentice alive, you don't really want to trade in the uh, Mana Worm either. So he didn't want to miss the four damage there. But I am kind of surprised he made that trade, as opposed to letting Aaron make that trade for him, if that was going to happen. Maybe he was kind of hesitant on his life total. He wanted to keep Aaron at a, out of Molten Giant range, maybe. That's why he made the trade. Uh, yeah, that's entirely possible as well. It, uh, it also could set up, um, if he's not as worried about the Sorcerer's Apprentice this late, uh, if he's more worried about something like the Mana Worms, it sets him up better for a uh, trade in the 2-2 and then Mortal Coil Cycle. Um, various just one damage trades here and there like that. But uh, he, he could have also elected to push the three damage towards face, but he decides to play it safe here. I do like that play instead of getting rid of the Flame Cannon, though. I think if you use the Flame Cannon, you do open yourself up a lot more to, uh, to those AoEs, and you are weakening your Flame Wakers later in the game. Yeah, I, Aaron, I agree with you there. It also would allow him to play Molten Giant this turn if he goes face there. Yeah, absolutely, too. And that's definitely another consideration is you have to worry about that uh, that Molten Giant life total, especially when you, you're you not really looking to sink those fireballs into it. You'd much rather sink them into the face. And if we don't see Aaron uh, drop the Taunt here or heal here, uh, this could actually... We're, we're starting to push towards game very, very quickly. It could just be one or two turns before uh, we see this closed out. Uh, Aaron with the Reno Jackson in hand to bring himself back up to life, but it also depends on how pressured he feels on his life total, especially depending on the trades we see here. Uh, 
Flame Waker coming down this turn, and it looks like we're just going to see the basic, uh, the trade on the Mana Worm and the ping here. To hopefully set them up for next turn to roulette some of these spells into the face for a lot of damage. Yeah, it looks, uh, looks pretty good. I think last turn I might have gone with the, another play he could have gone with was the, uh, the Spellbreaker Voidwalker as well. But he opted for the Lothab, kind of locked out a lot of that burn, so I think his play was better. I just pointed out another one that I saw last turn. Might have been an yeah, absolutely. It gives him the alternate option there. Uh, I think the Lothab is pretty good there because it does lock him out of uh, it locks him out of playing a lot of cheap spells there, especially with uh, a lot of that removal in his hand. He could have had the option like he'd had to Flame Waker, Coin, Flame Cannon, Arcane Missiles, and all of a sudden, not only uh, not only is he worried about the multiple ping coming in, but also those Mana Worms get massive and they end up dealing a total of you know three, four, five, six more damage even split across the two Mana Worms. Yeah, definitely. And uh, it does get leave him the silence here for the Flame Waker, so that was good. Otherwise, he would have had a really awkward turn dealing with that. Maybe, maybe even Siphon souling it, but it seems like an overreaction. So silence yes. a lot, really good. Yeah, Siphon Soul is a slight overreaction, but uh, there aren't too many targets for the Siphon Soul. We do see the Doctor Boom in hand that uh, will probably get Siphon Soul next turn, assuming we see it come out. And we are going to see the other Flame Waker uh, coin into Flame Cannon or Arcane Missiles. Arca yeah, yeah, definitely. There. Yeah, yeah, if you get the double ping right there, even the single ping, you probably have to try it with the arcade missiles. Yeah, that's, a lot, that's a lot of shots going there, but the, yeah, the flame cannon was definitely an option. It was mana efficient as well, but it does allow him to save it for another larger minion later on, so. Molten yeah, Giant we, Reno looking pretty good here. Yeah, Molten Giant Reno, and this is exactly what we were talking about at the beginning of the matchup, where uh, when this Molten Giant and this Reno come down, uh, Mikkelgo is going to have a very hard time answering this... Uh, answering this without uh using too many of his resources because he is starting to thin himself on draw uh unstable portal could be pretty big here as well as this uh dr boom and we are going to see him get to trade these minions out fairly efficiently but even still mickle go has another 30 health he has to grind through here and if aaron can pick up something like a twisting nether or he can make this hellfire clean up the board then mickle go could be very stranded in the water very quickly and he has a lot of heals still left. He uses the Reno, but he already has the heal bot in hand. He already has the Draxus in hand. So a lot of utilities. Aaron might be able to hold this off. Yeah, he may be able to save this off. He uh, he got through the initial phases anyway, and he got the Reno. So he was able to close out the early game. Now he just needs to figure a way to close out all these minions here. And he doesn't have the Shadow Flame. Uh, he does have the Hellfire here, but the Hellfire does leave the Flame Waker at 1 HP unless he decides to double trade it with either the Molten Giant or using another spell, which I don't really think you would want to afford. Uh, I don't really think you could afford to use another spell here. So you don't but think you, also... uh, you don't like the Hellfire Demon Wrath to clear the board? Uh, I'm not particularly a big fan of it. Okay. Uh, all it really enables you to do is push an extra 8 damage towards the face, which I don't think is super important in this matchup since uh, Aaron's not too worried about pressuring Mikkelgo's life total. He's really just worried about surviving these cards he has. And since he's already seen a lot of the threats be played, double Flame Waker, double Mana Worm, he knows most of the minion threats are already out of the way. And he's already seen a Fireball and a significant uh, portion of spells, so... Yeah, I like that play better from uh, Aaron as well. I was going to put up the, the Twilight Drake, as you can see. That other minion would have just cleared the board and given all the tempo back to your opponent. So not being greedy with the damage, I definitely agree as uh, with your point as well. Yeah, absolutely. And now he gets to make the good trade on the Drake here. And we do see that Mikkelgo had dropped Counterspell last turn. Uh, this is going to make Aaron sequencing a lot harder in the future turns. This is another reason why keeping that Demon Wrath is so important, though, is because Demon Wrath, since it is a lower value spell at this point, uh, with Mikkelgo not building as big of boards, uh, it's a lot lower impact than the Siphon Soul, but the Siphon Soul would have gotten wasted if he had Demon Wrath that turn, as it would have gotten Counterspelled, which would have locked Aaron out of either playing Siphon Soul or he would have ended up just wasting it on accident. And he realizes that now after dropping the heal bot and not seeing it get copied. Interesting. Dr. Boom, yeah, nice Siphon Soul target finally. It's gonna come out. Yep, nice Siphon Soul target, but we are gonna have to see him, uh, we are gonna see, ha see him sequence this in the correct order. He does need to play the Demon Wrath before he Siphon Souls. Exactly. Otherwise, that Siphon Soul will get counterspelled. Yeah, that would be uh, unfortunate for him. Also, the mind control tech being played last turn, and now he could have gotten advantage of it. I wonder if uh, yeah. Mikkelgo was playing around that at all, or if it was just luck of the draw. 
Um, it was probably more luck of the draw than anything, but uh, we definitely, if we hadn't seen the mind control tech hit the table that turn, it's possible that we would have just seen a vanilla Dr. Boom and then uh, something like an unstable portal follow-up instead of committing the mad scientist to the board. Okay, yeah, it makes sense. He feels a lot safer dropping. Yeah, Plain definitely. Once you've seen the first... Tech, if yeah, it's in the back yeah, once yeah, exactly. And you do have to definitely consider uh, cards like Mind Control Tech, especially when playing against Reno. A lot of Reno builds do run one of Mind Control Tech because you are running 30 unique cards, and you do have to fill that space somewhere. So people like to pick up those tech cards, help you swing a couple of those matches, and it just gives you more unpredictability to play around. So he's debating on the Demon Wrath before trading, hoping to get those... Uh... Oh, because of the counterfill. Yeah, we talked about it earlier, then I forgot that he hadn't done it yet, obviously. Yeah, he had a line of play this turn where he could have uh, he could have avoided using the Siphon Soul by just trading the minions, but it does look like he's going to elect to use that Siphon Soul to clean up the Doctor Boom, which is good. Uh, the only other real target you're looking for is, with the Siphon Soul in Mikkelgo's deck would be the Archmage Antonidas, or anything very crazy that gets pulled off of an Unstable Portal, which that Ancient of Lore is a very big pickup. In yeah, this no, I was going to comment that. Out. Yeah, not bad at all. Allows him to, uh, he, he was slightly fizzling out, drawing into a lot of spells, and the Ancient Allure might be just with the Doctor Ordered here. Yeah, that Ancient Allure and picking up the Antonitis here will very likely see a, uh, uh, yeah, he, he's probably going to drop the Sorcerer's Apprentice here, hopefully next turn, to clear out this with either the Frostbolt or the Flame Can, then next turn set up a cheap Antonitis where he can cycle hopefully one or two spells off of it. And this is putting a very big board back in front of Aaron to deal with, and he's very unsafe to play Jaraxxus, and he's not drawing very well either. This Stalag gets traded out fairly easily, and it's very... It doesn't look like he has a lot of good minions to taunt up with this Defender of Argus either. Yeah, Jaraxxus here would be uh, very unfortunate for him. I don't think he'd be able to, to come back from that, and so I don't see it coming on. He doesn't either. So oh, we're going to see the... Apprentice. Yeah, we're going to see the Iron Beak Owl uh, silencing the Apprentice, which in theory isn't a bad play uh, because you do have to stop those spells from cycling cheaper. But it is definitely going to be unfortunate when we see the Antonitis come down next turn, uh, possibly wishing he had held that another turn. Though at this point in the game, I'm actually not entirely sure it matters. I think this Antonitis cycling these spells is going to be enough to, uh, to push this over the top. Well, he's going to hold off on it. Hmm. Yeah, he's going to hold off and just pressure uh, pressure damage with face, and I actually don't disagree with this play at all. There's no need for him to commit the Antonitis to the big board. He can essentially sit back and say, Aaron, you as the Reno player have to find your one answer, and there it was. Yep. The Twisting Nether. <laughs> if yeah. he had played the Antonitis, he would have cycled the additional Fireball, but the Twisting Nether would have capitalized on it, and instead, you're going to force Aaron to Twisting Nether this board with the Antonitis to follow it up, and now Aaron actually doesn't have a third have an answer to this Antonitis. And we even see a Conjure get picked up too, which is just another big minion. And it's going to draw him just yet another spell to cycle with his Archmage Antonitis. And all damage, except for that uh, except for that Frost Note, which he'll probably pass up. I like the Forgotten Torch here. It's three mana. Oh, he's going with the Fireball, but I just meant that you could go immediately go with it in the uh, Antonitis and essentially generate two more Fireballs off of it. But opting with the Direct Fireball instead. Well, I was, I was yeah. going to comment on Dark Bomb. I swear I was. <laughs> that would have been a great answer to hear. But he picks it up anyway. So that's just Yeah, Dark, Dark Bomb right off the top. But uh, we are we are concerned with healing. And, you know, at this point in the game, one of the things Aaron has to consider is Aaron has to consider whether or not he has to life tap to find more of his healing. I don't think we saw him use his antique heal bot in this game, did we? Oh, uh, yes, we did. It did get cycled? Yes. Okay, well, if the Antique Heal Bot's been cycled and he's seen the Reno Jackson cycled, then unfortunately, I think Aaron does just realize that he's dead to uh, quite a number of spell combinations. Even if we hadn't seen the Fireball picked up there, uh, the Antonitis being able to cycle spells or the Drake into a 7 damage Fireball would have been pretty big. And without uh, a lot of healing left of the deck, probably is forced to Jaraxxus on the next turn. Yeah. Didn't have a really great way out of that. He saw it as well and just uh, kind of hoped that he didn't have the, the burst, but he did. So that means that uh, Mikkelgo going to take game one with the mage, continuing his streak in this tournament. Yeah, continuing his streak with this uh, this tempo and tempo mage in this tournament, he does pick up the win right there, which presents uh, an interesting question as to what we're going to see Aaron lead off with against next. Yeah. Uh, Mikkelgo switching back to... He's going to be forced to either play Zoo or his Warrior deck we haven't seen yet. Uh, if it's Patron, then that would be very, very bad to play into the Reno. Uh, depending on who you are, a lot of people do have this uh, this idea that Reno can 
uh, can just absolutely trash can the patron decks, but some people argue that the matchup is a lot closer to 50-50 than a lot, a lot of people think. Uh, I know Trump is one of the few people who thinks that it's an 80-20 matchup and that uh, Reno has no hope, and I do tend to think Reno is very highly favored in that matchup, but some expert level players argue that it's closer to a 50-50 than most people think. Yeah, I, I think it, uh, it would come down to when you get your removal, because you, uh, as the Reno Warrior, you only tr generally play one of each of those removals, so if you don't have that when you need it on that board of patrons, if you don't draw Hellfire in time and they go off on patrons, that's going to be really I difficult to clean up. Absolutely, it's a very hard combo for them to deal with. If they're missing the Hellfire or the Shadow Flame, and they don't draw into Reno early, it's very easy for the Reno lock to just get stomped out by a patron with a tur with a good turn five, where they get to play patron into an activator coin or swing with the Death Spite, get four patrons on board. And if the answer is not there, I mean that's a lot of damage for the Warlock to deal with, and if especially if they don't have Reno to make up for that twenty the uh, twenty twenty five points that they'll be missing of health then it's very hard for uh it's very hard for them to close the game out but if they draw the uh if they draw the hellfires it's a very easy match for them to clean up you can just sit on hellfire sure. all game well, that's the beauty of patron that's kind of been its whole strategy uh, especially after the nerf of war song commander was i'm gonna go off on this board if you can answer it great if not you're probably toast <laughs> Yeah, pretty much. They play the uh, they play the very much. I'm gonna do my combo, and uh, you either have your answer, or you don't. Right. We do see uh, we do see Mikkel go cue the zoo in here though, and he does have a nice uh, one two three curve with the haunted creeper here. Uh, Brand not as attractive on three without any battle cries to go off with it, but still a nice like two four body to put on the board, and it really does depend on what we see the warlock play here. Uh, we are gonna see him dark bomb down this three two to take some of this pressure off the board early. Yeah, I kind of like the brand here. I mean, you're Zoo. You want to flood the board, and uh, yeah, you already know absolutely. what you're up against. So, absolutely, especially with the DOA pickup here, the uh, the brand's going to be huge because, excuse me, if we don't see the brand cleared this turn, we are going to see this Defender of Argus come down and buff this into a four six brand and a three five spider or uh, three four spider, and those are going to be very significant minions for a reno warlock especially this early on in the game to deal with hellfire won't be able to clean them up very easily anymore and he's gonna have to shadow flame a big target which he doesn't have at this point yeah it'll set up nice trades for uh Mikkelgo if aaron plays into some of these uh slower minions either earth and ring farce well any of these minions that he can play are gonna prevent or gonna open him up to nice trades for Mikkelgo. I, I think i said that yeah. poorly but yeah, we, we possibly will see some... Uh, it, there should be some good trades for Mikkelgo, certainly. We saw Aaron hover the Iron Beak, and I think he's considering it because he does recognize that that turn four defender of Argus is going to put him in such an unfavorable position that I think he has to go ahead and use his silence here to try and avoid taking massive damage from this. Yeah, I, I agree with this. If you can't answer it, you gotta you got to slow it down. And it's not only a, a minion on board... But it has the battle cry effect, so getting a little bit of value off of it now, you can't you can't hold back and be greedy with it. Absolutely, especially considering his hand right now. There's really not much he's going to have going for him, and uh, this defender of Argus play would have just absolutely crippled his board. As is though, we see it come down regardless. Uh, Mikkelgo is going to play that, get these minions. Uh, get these minions taunted and buffed up and then leaves him with a nice stable board uh, a little weak to hellfire here but he does at least get the two one one spiderlings back out so it's not a completely cleared board and it does give uh, tempo back to Mikkelgo but as is with no removal we are just going to see an earthen ring farce here get played down to provide a little bit of healing and relieve some of this pressure that owl being used up though makes Mikkelgo feel a lot better about dropping this Nerubian egg so that's going to be interesting to see how that could have a lot of impact on this game without an answer yeah, definitely. We're seeing this Nerubian egg come down, and we do see the Void Caller get picked up on the draw there for Mikkel Go. Uh, no demons in hand yet, but uh, we could definitely lean to some interesting board states a little bit later on with that coming into play. Dr. Boom in hand, too, for the later turns. Uh, Aaron picks up the Demon Wrath here, but he picks it up uh, yeah. definitely one turn too late, because you don't really want to drop into this egg here, especially taking up your entire turn so he is just going to opt for the uh the coin therosian but even this is a pretty unattractive play really you're only lowering the cost of four minions one of them is a molten giant so the one mana that you can <laughs> discount on that is pretty negligible most of the time yeah you can see it's dead on board so it's not like there's really no hope of it sticking around even yeah and we do see the lothep get dropped as a uh just one more axe that uh and Aaron's play, and with the Defender of Argus in play, and picking up the Sun Fury, he just absolutely has nothing to play this turn. Yeah, he's he has to tap. tap. 
Uh, not a bad pickup, but not the best. Yeah, it does pick up the Imp Gang boss, but uh, we are going to see this Imp Gang boss get traded out fairly easily here. Probably just going to see the... Uh, well, it depends on if uh, if Mikkelgo wants to respect some, some removal, and it looks like he does. He's going to put the Taunter up, actually, and keep his Lotheb at full health here to try and respect uh, some of the AoEs. Uh, Shadow Flame, buffed up Shadow Flame, uh, Hellfire here. But all, all the AoEs are really unattractive here anyway with this O2 egg on board. And now with this uh, this 3-4, all the AoEs are pretty much dead in Aaron's hand because he's going to generate such value. Or Mikkelgo, rather, will generate such value if Aaron plays any of his cards that uh, can clear this board up. Yeah, generally you want to drop Dr. Boom on Seven, but I think that was a rare situation where you don't want to because you got to kind of respect the AoE. You haven't seen any yet. And uh, this, you know, it's still kind of early in the game, but this late in the game, you don't want to. You gotta expect that he's got something that you haven't made it out yet. You can afford to play around it, so just be a little bit patient. Even though you are Zoo, you're more of the demon, demon Zoo, so you can afford to be a little bit patient there. So I like it. Yeah, you can definitely be, uh, afford to be a lot more patient in this matchup, and uh, especially like we were saying with these death rattle creatures, they they are just gonna impact this board and prevent him from doing any of his AOE combinations to uh, help clear this board up. And yeah, that really does put Aaron in a tough position. These Shadow Flames and Demon Wraths, very unattractive, and all he can really afford to do is taunt more minions up. So we'll probably see something like a Molten Giant come out and get taunted up in the next turn. Yeah, I think uh, we're, one of Aaron's outs for this game, looking at it at this point in the game, uh, and depending on how they're going to play it out, obviously, but just a short analysis would be if Mikkelgo extends into the AoE and Aaron's able to keep a small board and set up the Molten Giant Shadow Flame, that seems to be one of his big comeback mechanisms in this game. So it's going to depend on how Mikkelgo, you know, avoids playing into that. Yeah, certainly. He has to avoid uh, overpressuring the overpressuring Aaron's life total too much and setting up that Molten Giant Shadow Flame combo. Though he's at the point where he there really is no no playing around it anymore. Uh, the Warlock himself is just going to tap his life down low enough that uh, he's going to be able to play this on one of the following turns. Uh, not this coming turn, but the one after this. Oh, sure. It's going to happen. It's just Mikkel goes allowing, keeping enough cards in hand that he can recover and reload on the board after it, that it won't affect him as much. He, yeah, certainly. He's, he's going to have to clean this up, Void Caller up, before he even considers dropping a Molten Giant Shadow Flame. Uh, for the exact reason that we're looking at Mikkel goes hand, those double Doom Guards do present a very lethal threat over a very short number of turns uh, towards Aaron, especially with the lack of healing we are seeing in his hand right now. A lot of taunts, but we haven't seen the Reno Jackson come out yet, or the Antique Heal Bot, and those are going to be very key cards in this matchup to keep Zoo from killing you. If he had enough mana, a really nice turn right now would have been Demon Wrath would have popped both of the Death Rattles, and you could follow that up with a Molten Shadow Flame. That would have been a pretty nice board clear here, but unfortunately not enough mana to do so. So very awkward here. Yeah, definitely an awkward turn here. And uh, this Demon Wrath actually won't pop the uh, Void Caller. Oh, so he of can't... course. <laughs> yeah, yeah. As, as the Void Caller is a demon, uh, the yeah. Demon Wrath is going to pop the Void Caller, so he still doesn't have a clean clear for this. And it looks like he's going to Demon Wrath anyway. But, uh... Yeah, I'm not entirely sure if he remembered whether or not the 3-2 triggered, and we are going to see the Molten Giant come down. So it'd be really huge here if uh, Mikkelgo had a PO to just clean this Molten Giant up nice and cleanly. Yeah, these guys are very high skill level, so he was probably aware of it, but there's a small chance that he forgot, just like I did. You know, you get you get caught up in the moment, you just look at their their health total, you're like, oh, two damage, boom, two damage is that, and then it's just like, oh, yeah, of course, duh, moment. So I don't, I don't know if yeah. that's what happened or not, but it might have been. And we are going to see Lethal pulled out yeah. here. The uh, since we did, he was able to cheat the Doom Guard into play. He was able to avoid discarding the other one and was able to drop the Abusive ahead of time to give him just enough damage, one point over Lethal. And we're going to see Mikkel go close out the second game, winning with his Zoo Warlock uh, against that Reno Lock again. Yeah, it may seem really basic if you're a high high level skill player, but. Uh... That, that sequencing was really nice from from Mikkel Go. It's just those subtle things, keeping your head in you know in the championship match of a of a tournament. You've been playing all day, and uh, just keeping it the sequencing. I think you did it really well. I mean, it's yeah, the stress absolutely. should not be overrated. 
Yeah, definitely. You definitely have to keep your composure, especially this many games into the tournament. I mean, uh, most of these players have played, uh, have had to win seven series to get here, uh, unless they got a buy, in which case they only had to win six, I believe. Or, sorry, seven to seven to get here with a buy, eight without a buy. So, yeah, I mean, they've been playing, most of these players have been playing since one o'clock uh, Eastern Standard Time. So here we are eight hours into this tournament. You still have to keep all your composure. Make sure that you're getting those triggers in exactly the right order. Make sure you're doing everything to maximize your potential to win all these games yeah and here we are now game three of the championship l final open number 17 we'll see if uh mick will go can close off the sweep with his warrior or if aaron can start to pull it back here he's going to go with that warlock again if he's not able to stave off elimination this could be his last game yeah um aaron here with the Hellfire Emperor in hand. Hellfire Emperor Jaraxxus Stalag deciding what to uh, deciding what to mulligan here. Probably going to see this Jaraxxus Therosian Stalag. Uh, I have to imagine that he's going to keep keep the Hellfire since he's got to be considering that this is a patron matchup, and Hellfire is absolutely the nut card in this matchup. If you want to win this matchup quicker than anything else, you've got to have that Hellfire in your hand. Yeah, that's a make or break moment in the match and uh, i think he's going to keep it for the exact reason you said yeah that, in fact it's the only key card he keeps off the mulligan yep Spotted keeps everything there so it does look like he is mulliganing this like it is patron uh generally you'd mulligan for lower cost cards anyway but there is some argument to keeping a couple of those cards possibly if you think that you're playing into control uh gets the nice zombie jo uh the zombie chow pickup early and he does have at least some of these more mid-range minions but we are going to see the fiery war axe back to answer it yeah, he mulliganed for that, and he got it. That was pretty big, pretty big pickup, able to stave off this early pressure. Not that it was a whole yeah. lot, but still Yeah, nice. getting the zombie jail cleared out of the way is, uh, you know, it's nice. It opens your board up, and this is going to give him a... Uh, give him... Ooh, Finley. see? We see the, yeah, we see the Finley pickup. Uh, there are a lot of patron players who think that Finley is just an absolutely like, great card to have, and it's hard to argue with a lot of them for certain hero powers when you pick it up. Yeah. Sometimes you do just pick up a dead hero power, but sometimes you get the Warlock hero power, and the Warlock hero power, especially with Patron, can be crazy just getting that extra draw engine. Yeah, not only that, but in, in Patron, your armor is not a whole, not a huge big of a factor, like it is in Control Warrior, for obvious reasons. I won't go into that, but the... Uh... Sir Finley also opens up other hero powers that you can use to propagate patrons or heal your patrons back up. Uh, talking about the mage hero power helps you propagate a little bit easier. The priest hero power helps you spot heal your patrons and take more advantage of them. Uh, we mm -hmm. see he does not pick up either of those, so this is a little bit awkward here. Yeah, this is a little bit awkward. I have to imagine that we'll see either the shapeshift pickup to help clear some of the minions off the board and just make the trades a little bit easier, or we'll see the steady shot pickup here for straight damage Agreed. if he yeah. thinks he needs to race. Reinforce and doesn't seem very good. The paladin hero power doesn't seem very good here. Yeah, with most decks, unfortunately, the paladin hero power is fairly lackluster. It just doesn't really provide enough on on board. The the one one itself just isn't that important, and especially in a matchup like this, uh, those one ones get traded off very easily by these high health minions Aaron has, or even just by the tokens, or even generate more tokens for Aaron himself. Right. <laughs> yeah. One one very very small fact that could be good about the paladin hero power would be if you if you're trying to buff a frothing berserker. That's about it otherwise i do not endorse it and uh it's very very minimal but just kind of a thought i had yeah very minimal uh could could be useful but uh mm. it does just give you the one extra for the for the little tokens and the tokens in general are less useful than such as like the mage hero power which is targeted it's only one damage on the frothing as opposed to the two from the token trade oh yeah i'd, I'd probably never take it it's just fun to think about <laughs> It is fun to think about it. You generally take any other hero power first, though. You are correct. We are just seeing him uh, barely just start to pressure with this Finley, applying the little the little one here. <laughs> yeah. Considering what to do with this weapon, considering whether or not he wants to swing this weapon here and drop the Death Spite, or if he wants to drop the Armor Smith hero power. Uh, curious to see him play the unstable ghoul i generally don't like to see the unstable ghouls played this early on since it is possible aaron can clean this up pretty easily with something say like a dark bomb uh probably wouldn't waste it on uh something like the unstable ghoul but he could easily just drop a minion here that'll be able to trade into it efficiently and then you are lacking one more of those activators 
Maybe he's trying to bait out some sort of removal, like, like that exact Dark Bomb, hoping that Aaron does not have the Hellfire when he draws patrons and then prevents him from using spot removal. Hard yeah, to say. It's, yeah, it's possible to take a line of play like that. And uh, he does get this Drake traded out here on this Execute. And now he has the Armor Smith to establish some armor. So even if this gets traded, we're not going to see a complete waste on the uh, Unstable Ghoul. But it does seem a little unfortunate to just not have it for the patrons. Sure. Yeah, I'm just here to advocate game. for the players. <laughs> hey, not a problem, man. Like, hey, sometimes they make better plays than I do, sure. certainly. If you saw my patron matches last week, uh, I <laughs> I think Mikkel Go could play this deck a lot better than I can. <laughs> Ragnaros, uh, though, that's interesting. Yeah, Ragnaros. See I'm that pop that up? One. Yeah, we just skimmed that over. Yeah, we kind of skimmed over that one, but uh, seeing Ragnaros pick up, definitely an interesting tech choice on Mikkel Go's part. Ragnaros, not uh, generally an included card. Uh, I wonder what he decided to cut for that in favor. Oh, yeah, that's an interesting... Yeah, obviously, something has to go. Yeah, I'm curious if he removed <laughs> one of his, uh, his more in-game threats. Uh, you probably wouldn't see the Grom go out, and I do th think we'll probably see the Dr. Boom if we... We have yeah, we have, this is our first game seeing this deck, so yeah, we haven't seen the Dr. Boom either. It's possible he pulled Dr. Boom out for Rag, but I can't imagine he would. Uh, but it is it is definitely curious to see it played in Patron. Uh, we do see him go ahead and trade out the Earthen Ring Farseer with the last charge of the weapon. Still has this Armor Smith in play, and he's able to establish this Death Spite to hopefully set up for Patrons in the future turns, which we are lacking Patrons and Activators. Yeah, he didn't have a great turn otherwise, so saw his opportunity to, to sneak in the Death Spite there and hope that he can draw into something going forward. He's gonna, otherwise it's gonna be pretty awkward turns going, for him going forward. He might have to drop the rag on turn eight. Yeah, he might, he might just have to drop this rag Ooh, here on Ooh, huge pickup. Not this turn, but. Yeah, we definitely, we definitely see that patron come down. And uh, I have to imagine that we're gonna see him uh, go ahead and use the armor smith to clear the first bomb, yep. weapon to clear the second bomb, and then we're gonna see this BGH drop to get a full clear. Gives him board control back, sets the weapon up to one HP, which is important for the patron. Boomba goes face, that's good for him. He's going to yeah, keep boombox. the uh, Boombot alive. He's going to go face. Yeah, that's definitely curious. Uh, I generally, I think, prefer keeping, just killing the Boombot there. But he is trying to set himself up for some form of lethal here with, like, a possible Ragnaros hit to the face. Guarantee that he hits for 12 next turn. He's really only lacking two points. And uh, since Ragnaros is kind of a surprise card... Uh, it could catch him off guard, but since he's already that low and he has the Death Spite Activator, you already have to play around uh, Gromash Hellscream coming out and being able to deal that 10 points of damage. So sure. Aaron realizes at this point that he is not safe at 14. He definitely needs to get himself off this bubble, and he's got to be looking at this Antique Heal bot to do that. Yeah, unfortunately, you can't Demon Wrath along oh. with it. So that's going to yeah. be an unfortunate sequence there. Yeah, won't get a nice clear here, and we did see that Boombot unfortunately go face right there. So Mikkel gets a little bit uh, lucky there with the Boombot going towards his face instead of clearing either one of his minions, which makes this turn even more awkward for Aaron. Yeah, I think uh, we're going to have to take the, the gamble here, get the heal. Or not the gamble, but take the safe play here instead of the gamble. And just try to taunt off and hold up as much as you can, but... I don't know. Yeah, definitely. And we do, We he at least has the rag to answer it here. And, you know, now that he was able, because he made this safe play and because this uh, this patron's actually not going to have a second activator, and even if it did with the Hellfire to clean it up, uh, we are going to see Aaron be able to swing this board a little bit more back towards his side, especially with the Siphon Soul to answer the Ragnaros when it comes down on the following turn. Yeah, I think he held the, the Dread Corsair there to play around Hellfire. He, if he can answer this board, then uh, he doesn't want to donate that Dread Corsair as well. So held that back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly. Probably was not and an anytime, accident. Yeah, anytime you, uh, you are going to use a... Uh, you are going to use a Death Spite, uh, your final charge on it, you do always have to consider putting those Dread Corsairs into play because you do just weaken them down to a 3-2 immediately. And uh, sometimes playing that 3-2 is just more detrimental to your board state. Uh, it could lead to an easier Dark Bomb Demon Wrath, for example, trade out. Uh, we had already seen the Dark Bomb played earlier, but 
certainly something to be considered. And we do see him Hellfire to clean it up and go ahead and tempo out the MC tech, figuring it won't get a lot of value here. Well, there's the Dr. Boom, though, so he didn't cut that for the rag, so the search continues. <laughs> yeah, the search continues. He probably <laughs> cut uh, one of the tech cards. We are going to see... Uh, this is going to be an interesting interesting line of play to see how he's going to be able to deal with this. You have to imagine he's going to play Siphon Soul here since he doesn't have a good Shadow Flame turn. Yeah. And this does at least allow him, hopefully, next turn to have the uh, the Shadow Flame into Sylvanas to take this Ragnaros that I imagine we'll see being played on the following turn by Mikkel. The Rag will get the fight or the eight damage in first before uh, Aaron's able to trade off, though. So. We'll see, yeah, he uh... will. Yeah, we will get the eight damage in, and that might pressure his life to. Ooh, no, he oh. just needs the, uh, he needs the rag to hit, oh, but he can rag and execute, this is, oh, he does get back up to, uh, uh to nine. Yeah, he got back up to nine, okay. unfortunately, from Siphon Soul, if we hadn't seen yeah, the Siphon Yeah, I got the, I got the hype, I forgot about the heal from Siphon Soul real quick. <laughs> got too excited. See, uh, yeah, we are gonna see this rag come down regardless, though, and, uh, man, he's just one mana off, he's staring at that, uh, that rag execute hero power. Yeah. Just, <laughs> just a little bit off, and I, I think he's considering going, yeah, and he does, he's gonna YOLO it. He's gonna throw the rag down and see if he can hit the 50-50. Yeah, I mean it's not like it's not really a gamble here too much. I mean if it hits the the mind control tech, it's really not that huge of a deal. You're far from out of it. Ooh, though Reno though. Ooh, Reno here. You know, <laughs> with him at seven HP, and since he made that rag play, you have to assume that because he was at nine, he doesn't have Gromash plus an activator. So you're safe from Gromash plus uh, activator damage. So at seven, you're realistically not too unsafe you can consider which i think he's yeah, gonna do i was gonna say i like this better definitely yeah I, and i like this better too taking control of this ragnaros and forcing him to answer it and putting eight damage in his face starting to build a clock of your own i think it really shows the the skill from for both of these players but that play being obviously the skill of aaron and the patience that he showed there not just freaking out and slamming reno jackson on the board but realizing that the uh the damage may not be there from his opponent, and he can take it a little bit slower, even though he's already down to seven health. Yes, yeah, certainly, and we are going to see him give pressure. Uh, one damage off Leaf. Yeah. <laughs> two, un two unfortunate turns in a row. We are going to see that get punished. Not really punished. He had to make that play. I think it was still his best play. But we are going to see the Reno Jackson come down and bring uh, our Warlock player back up to 30 HP. And this poses a very daunting task for Mikkel to figure out how to get through. Already having seen one patron go, and his Dr. Boom and his Ragnaros, we only really have Gromash Hellscream and a second patron, and possibly some Frothing Berserkers to get the rest of this damage in here. Mikkel go running double piloted shredder along with those dread corsairs, so he's got a uh, some some uh, non traditional cards in here that seem to be working for him though. So I'm not judging. I'm just saying that they're uh, a little bit non traditional. Yeah. Yeah, it seems to be helping out. Uh, generally, we do see players either favor uh, the Pilot Shredder or the Cochrane Elite specifically, or as you said, the Dread Corsair. One of those three generally gets removed from the deck, so seeing two Pilot Shredders, a Cochrane, and a Dread Corsair all getting played, certainly interesting here. It looks like he likes to have that burst like, with the Corcoran Elite and the Ragnaros. Looks like he's uh, trying to throw off his opponents with that, little, having a little bit more burst than you're used to. Out of yeah, definitely. Having a little bit, a uh, little bit more of a way to close the game out definitely helps in uh, some of those matchups where they won't be expecting as much damage. You know, Aaron actually, if he had been at six HP, thinking he was safe from the Reno, uh, that Cochrane Elite plus Hero Power could have definitely caught him off guard. Yeah. Yeah, you never think about the the Warrior Hero Power, so that would have been very easy to to forget about in the yeah, moment. Yeah, absolutely. High skill level. I wonder if you even played around that. Like, oh, maybe he's got a Corcron and Hero Power. It's, it's just be interesting to like hear their commentary mid-game if he, if that even crossed his mind. Because I know it wouldn't have crossed my mind at all. Yeah, it's definitely uh, you definitely have to consider all the outs there. But uh, the Cochrane probably not probably not uh, always the expected card. Enough people run it that I think uh, if you're playing at this high of a level, that Aaron definitely had to at least consider it. Yeah, what is it is possible at all. it just slipped his mind. Uh, yeah, fortunately, so he was safe about. though. Yeah, fortunately he was safe, so it was pretty irrelevant in the moment, but definitely interesting to consider. Uh, as is here, we are going to see Mikkel going. He's going to go ahead and silence that, realizing that I do. Yeah, he does yes, have lethal. Yeah, I was going to say. It, exactly. If he did have lethal, obviously silencing the Shredder, but counting it out, recounting it out, making sure that he had enough damage there on board, which uh, probably most of us saw. 
that it was enough damage on board. Just making sure he didn't fudge up the math and cost him a game there and would have been eliminated if he loses that one, so. Yeah, careful. certainly. Yeah, gotta always double count, uh, double count everything, double, triple count. You know, 29 for sure, the old meme that <laughs> yeah, I'm sure everybody's seen. Yeah, speaking of fire bet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, speaking of indeed. <laughs> Not that that was his fault. That was just, he was just involved in that. In yeah, that just game. just involved. Yeah. Just involved. Still, still really funny though. Yeah, it's hilarious. Yeah, it just was a, a game of the, you know like the the pressure mounting. Even professionals, you know, they gotta you know count it up, make sure that their that their math is correct, and everybody makes mistakes. So count it, recount it, make sure you got it. If you're in, uh, especially if you're in high level tournaments. Yeah, definitely. I do think that we uh, we actually saw a couple of those games. I think it was this weekend in the uh, Asia Pacific qualifiers that uh, somebody did actually combo off. Uh, it was either with Freeze Mage or it was with uh, actual Druid combo, and they did miss lethal. So even at the highest of skill levels where people are playing for thousands of dollars, yeah. thousands of dollars, and... You know, 15 championship points, the and real. I think an I think an automatic invite if you win uh, if you win any of the qualifiers. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm not 100 sure on the Asia Pacific rule, but I know that is the fact with uh, with the Americas region. If you win that 128 qualifier, you get a seat. Like Amnesiac was the victor of this season, so he is into BlizzCon already. Yep, Amnesiac is guaranteed a spot in BlizzCon, and. Uh, yeah, good stuff all around. And but here in this tournament, we are ready for game four of the Elefino Open number 17 championship match. Aaron trying to stave off elimination yet again. Yeah, game four, we are going to see Aaron playing his control warrior into this patron. Uh, another matchup that patron has a very hard time with. Uh, Aaron's lineup, very good for very good for this matchup. Uh, cards like Brawl, very huge in this. Uh, very much penalizes Mikkel for building those large board states with a lot of patrons, committing a lot of pressure, committing a lot of activators, just to see it all get brawled away on five mana and then easily cleaned up. I really like this side. It could be a turn three play from Mikkelgo. Could be a really strong turn three play. Coining the Despite and putting out the uh, Dread Corsair is what I'm looking at from from him next turn. Yeah, we might see him play that, and that would uh, that gives the Warrior the option to either Despite in answer or go ahead and drop the Elise. Uh, we have to. I had to imagine that he's either going to Despite, uh, probably Despite here. If he drops the Shredder, Shredder, sure, that's yeah. strong play. Yeah, Shredder strong play as well. Um, I, th I don't know if I like cleaning this up with the death spite more, or if I like just dropping the Elise and just offering the trade. Uh, you're definitely going to get, I feel like, at least a two for one with the Elise, and your opponent's not really willing to commit a lot of his one damage spells to it. I feel like yeah. uh, it does give them an option to slam cycle on you, which you have to consider, and uh, still leave their minion on board, and you don't have the weapon equipped, so that is something to consider. Right. Yeah. If you're expecting to want to weapon down a uh, minion next turn and drop it with your Sludge Belcher. And establishing it now seems pretty good. He's gonna go with that route. Oh, totem yeah, golem ooh, though. Nice minion out of there. Yeah, some little bit of bad RNG there. Uh, the three four coming out definitely gonna be annoying for the warrior to have to pick up here. But he does have the double shield maiden in hand, the bash, the sludge belcher. So his health not uh not too relevant this early on in the match. Uh, we are going to see Dread Corsair get dropped out, which is nice. Uh, would be nice if uh, Aaron didn't have this Bash to go ahead and answer it. Right. Yeah, Bash uh, Hero Power seems like the play here. He's going to think it over, though. He does have the uh, he has the Slam if he wants to cycle first, and he can still accomplish the same thing. But I think he's got a, he's got a good enough turn six that I think he'll hold the Slam here. Yeah, I think you can afford to hold slam here. You're not uh, you're not hurting too bad on cards, and you'd probably rather cycle it when it's actually going to be better for you to trade on. But since you already have the bash plus the weapon, you're just going to be able to clear this out pretty easily. He may hold the bash even and just throw down the sludge belcher and force pickle go to go through it, since uh, his despite has not been used. It, he won't be able to clear off the first half of the sludge belcher with just the despite. So maybe he's going to save that bash and hope that he can use it against the patron. Could be a thought. Uh, definitely. Bash is one of those nice cards that's used, uh, especially on turn 8 after you use a Brawl to clean up the last patron. Uh, we don't see Mikkel with the patrons yet, but we are going to see him, and he is going to decide to Bash in this order. Uh, effectively, actually the same order, and I do like sure. this better because he doesn't lose the 3 armor when he Bashes first here. 
he does get to save his three extra armor, so this makes his shield slams a little bit better. Makes him a little more, a uh, little more resilient to losing that shield bash or uh, shield slam value. Rather. Yeah, good call. The little subtle differences in the uh, in the sequencing there coming in play again. And it looks like we are going to see this frothing berserker get to make committed to board, especially after we've seen that first death spite go through. He would need the second death spite or. Uh, some sort of armor plus shield slam since he did lower him below that threshold where he could armor and shield slam the frothing berserker all in one turn i we don't like do the shield maiden here you got the slam execute if you want it yeah the shield the shield maiden or the sludge belts are certainly unattractive oh, plays no. as they do just get cleaned up by this death spite with the whirlwind activation we even see the patron lurking in the hand to go ahead and create a pretty hectic board state here he is but going with the sludge belcher though and yeah, it looks it? like Aaron Aaron does want to opt for the Sludge Belcher here. Uh, definitely interesting con uh, to consider. Uh, Aaron not holding a... He doesn't have a Brawl in hand, though. And if Bickleco decides... Wow, yeah, with the second Patron pickup, he's definitely going to push for this. This is actually going to be huge. And the Whirlwind will clean this entire board up on uh, Aaron's side. So he's not going to lose a bit of damage from this Frawl thing. And this Frawl thing is going to go ahead and push through for a serious amount of damage. Yep, sequencing it correctly, making sure that his uh, Sir Finley will survive both Whirlwind's effects and be able yeah, to clear off like, the slime. It does look like it's going to be 14 damage, I believe, here on this. Uh, yeah, wow. We're going to see 14 push towards face. And Aaron, like I said, no brawl to answer this. Could be out right Ooh, revenge, here. though. Revenge is just revenge. what the doctor ordered. Yeah, revenge is <laughs> just what the doctor ordered. Pushed him just under that HP threshold. Wow. Whew. Big pickup right there. Keep his tournament life alive. Uh, we do still see that Grom Mash plus Inner Rage hanging out in the hand, though. So that is a uh, possible 12 damage finisher lurking around for a little bit later. Yeah, Grom, yeah. Well, he could be able to do it on turn 8. So we're getting getting closer and closer as you're talking about. So Aaron's going to have to get some armor up here. He's not going to go with it here. He wants to drop the Elise. Have some sort yeah. of board presence. Yeah, gonna go with the Elise here for board presence. Uh, I think he is, by almost all accounts, safe on life total here, so I don't necessarily mind the Elise play too much. Um, over establishing the shield block here. The shield block just puts you a little bit, uh, makes you a little bit safer, but. Yeah, I like the Elise as well. Dr. Boom, a huge pickup from Nikogo, so. Yeah, Dr. Boom, a huge pickup here. We're going to see the slam to cycle, and we're going to see the shield block for a second cycle. Got to find a uh, executor shield slam here. Picks up the brawl for the other patron when it comes around, or just one of these complex board states. I mean, I guess at this point, you would have to consider a brawl here on a really bad RNG uh, over whether or not you're actually going to be able to draw uh, something to finish off the rest of this. But with the execute in hand, we will just see him clean up this Dr. Boom. I think he's just trying to decide whether or not he wants to shield block first or use this Elise to trade out some of these bombs, possibly eat some more damage to the face before he shield blocks since the armor is more valuable. Sure. Yeah, I think uh, I think I would like that play as well. You're going to have to clear off these, these boom bots, so... Ugh, kind of awkward. Yeah, I definitely feel like if he is going to use Elise to trade into either of these bombs here, I would have preferred to see it sequenced uh, before... He had used that shield block just to keep his armor a little bit higher if they go face. Uh, we are going to see him pressured. Probably just going to see, ooh, another slam for cycle. I see double cycle, and then we are going to see him pass up using the execute to just go ahead and trade the Elise off the board. And this does give him BGH for the uh, Ragnaros or the Grumash Hellscream here. Yeah, maybe he wanted to trade off the Elise to prevent uh, Boombots giving... Mickle go lethal? And that's actually a very real consideration. If even one of those boom bots had hit the face for four here, this would actually just be game. Yeah. We would see this game get ended right here with uh with this Grom Ash plus the uh inner rage for twelve. Right on turn eight like we were talking about, but as is, we're just going to see him pressure a little bit of damage. I think he did go ahead and drop the armor smith down on board. Yeah, and then uh, this past turn, unfortunately, because he's only putting three damage down, and with that Justicar being a huge pickup here, we're going to see four armor a turn for Justicar for probably the rest of the game. Yeah, so it's, Justicar uh, would put him up to uh, 17, so the Boombots could still pull off some some nonsense. 
Yeah, I have to imagine this turn, just because of uh, sequencing with Justicar, you probably would opt for something more like the Shield Maiden. I like it. Plus either a Fiery War Axe or an Armor, just because you do get that turn 10 uh, Justicar, where you can use your hero power Justicar to upgrade your hero power, and then use your hero power again. Yeah, absolutely. Providing six armor out of the Justicar. It basically acts like its own little sh uh, mini shield maiden, except you stay with that buffed hero power, and that hero power can generally carry you to winning the game in a matchup like this. Just gaining four health a turn is too much for the warrior to keep up with. Ooh, those boom bots are hating on shield maidens today. We see another boom bot very cleanly taking out an entire shield maiden. Yeah, we do see just another one of those <laughs> those RNG those little RNG trades where you do get that four damage on the uh, the boom bot see the map get picked out and uh it is looking like the more this game goes on yeah we are gonna see this armor armor uh just car into tank up tank up being the upgraded warrior hero power to just give him yep. that extra four armor and now that he is going to be putting that four armor on board every single turn this is a really awkward for uh awkward position that mick will go finds himself in trying to amass enough damage in a one turn one turn span Aaron may have weathered the storm. I mean, he's not out of it yet by any means, but this brawl probably going to have to come out here. He's got the war axe to follow it up with. Uh, yeah, he's got the what brawl. he hopes will be the mech warper. Yeah, and it doesn't it doesn't actually matter in which uh, what minion survives as long as it isn't the armor smith. The armor smith would be the unfortunate pickup, but any other minion's fine here. He's going to get the clean clear. Uh, his health isn't that relevant with only two cards left and no patrons. Uh, does get the mech warper here, so he gets the best of all the trades, and we are just going to see him press that tank up again, I believe. Oh, absolutely. Every yeah, single turn. So pretty good board swing. He's at the uh, same amount of health. Yep, we're going to see this. Uh, we're going to see this inner rage. We're going to see Aaron immediately BGH, and I do believe when we see this BGH hit this Grom, we're going to see that concede come out of Mickle Go. He's going to realize that yeah. I don't think he has any more outs here. This is does all in him. play. It does push him down to seven, but because of the armor, it's not actually going to matter here. He's going to be uh, very safely out of these Cochran ranges. Yeah. That's a good point, though. He does have the uh, the hero power can add a damage, and the Cochran would be would be eight, but not enough in this scenario. Even going to be a little bit safer. Yeah, he is going to go for the, the because... ultimate safe play. Make sure he make sure he's solidly out of that range. No, uh, no weird tech cards coming out. Nothing like the. Uh, uh, that that is true. That if he hadn't shield maiden that turn, the Ragnaros fifty fifty plus the weapon would have actually been enough damage yeah. for him to have possibly gotten lethal. So he took the ultimate safe route, realizing and recognizing that uh, his opponent does play that Ragnaros and the Patron Warrior, giving him that possible lethal on eleven. Uh, Mikrogo sees it. Not gonna not gonna play it out. He's gonna take this. It's a game five. Let's see if his uh, patron warrior can find.